So growing up as a kid, I loved going back and watching films from the 30s to the 60s with my grandpa, whether it was a universal horror movie monster like we're talking about today, a movie about giant bugs taking over the world, or a western. And I haven't covered a whole lot of films from back in the day, pre-70s, but I want to get back into doing that. And today we're going to be jumping into another film from the universal horror monster lineage. Let's get into this one. What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video and in today's video we're going to be talking about The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Today we're jumping back to 1954 for a film directed by Jack Arnold with the underwater scenes being directed by the Gill Man himself, Rico Browning, and starring people like Richard Carlson, Julie Adams, Richard Jennings, and many, many more. Before we get too far into this, I want to say a big thanks to my guest here in this video, and that is Ryan of Worst Reviews, who recently joined me as I returned to doing things like random rambling here on my channel. A big thanks to him for joining me in that random rambling, as well as joining me here in this video, where I want to talk about 1954's Creature from the Black Lagoon. So far, I've only covered of the classic monsters, things like the 1931 Dracula and Frankenstein, but I do plan on going back a little bit more in the timeline and catching up on the others I've yet to cover. The reason I'm doing this one now is because I somewhat recently covered films like the two Swamp Thing movies as well as Man Thing and I felt like kind of keeping a similar swampy theme and jumping into Creature from the Black Lagoon. A classic film I've wanted to go back and revisit for this channel since the very beginning and as I mentioned in the intro, as a kid I loved going back and watching films from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s with my grandpa specifically. I would almost always have some sort of classic black and white film on or something that had been restored to color in some way and I was able to kind of just sit there and watch a lot of these movies. As a kid I wasn't the big film fan that I am today but I was definitely starting to kind of set the stones for that kind of a building in my life and here we are all these years later and I'm in love with going back and watching older films. And yeah as a kid if it wasn't Star Wars, Marvel, or DC comic characters the characters I found myself the most connected to were the horror icons and the ones that were the most notable for me as a kid were of course the slashers of the 80s since I grew up in the 90s they were still really prominent and big when I was a kid and still getting new installments when I was in my teens and when I was a young kid as well with things like Chucky and Freddy and Jason and even to this day with Michael Myers. And so all these years later, I've always loved the horror icons of old, especially things like the Universal Horror Monsters as I've always had a very special place in my heart for them. And I haven't covered a whole lot of them here on the channel yet. Outside of the original Dracula and Frankenstein, the only other Universal Horror Monster movies that I've covered here on the channel are things like the Brendan Fraser Mummy Trilogy, as well as Benicio Del Toro's 2010 Wolfman remake, and things like the Mummy remake that had Tom Cruise in it. I do look forward to going back and covering a lot more of those, but again, a big thanks to my guest Ryan for joining me here in this video. We're going to be hearing his thoughts in just a moment, but let's get into my initial thoughts on this movie. So like I mentioned before, this film is actually directed by Jack Arnold, but the man who plays the Gill Man, the creature from the Black Lagoon in this movie, is known as Rico Browning, and he also directed parts of this movie specifically the underwater scenes. This is a film that would be highly inspirational to Steven Spielberg, who 20 years later or so would end up directing Jaws, one of the most iconic films of all time, that without a doubt became the quintessential underwater monster movie. And then decades later will continue to be an inspiration for people like Guillermo del Toro as he directed things like Shape of Water. And so yeah, going back and watching this movie, I honestly had a lot of fun with it. This is a film that by today's standards is going to be slow to some and redundant. And so there's definitely some criticism criticisms I have as far as what holds up and what doesn't hold up. Before a film in the early 50s, this movie definitely holds up in so many other ways and honestly just kind of kept my interest. I found myself engaged while watching it. I wasn't bored. I found myself, you know, chuckling at some of the cheesy things here or there, some of the lines delivery, some of the actual lines that they actually have to say in the movie itself. Some of the dialogue, some of the moments are hilarious. Some of the kills are absolutely laughable by today's standards. And then there's moments where the music just ramps up just because somebody showed up on screen. 
and it's just kind of goofy by today's standards. So without a doubt, going back and watching a movie like this, you kind of always have to keep in mind that things are going to look and seem dated while you're watching it, even if it's still enjoyable. And that's kind of the fun part of me going back and watching movies like this, is I can kind of take my critic hat off just a little bit, and I can still kind of critique things and talk about what works and what doesn't work, but it's so detached from modern day cinema and what we expect from high quality acting, special effects, cinematography, and anything that comes out today, versus a movie that came out in the 50s that was starting to set the groundwork for films that would start to change the world as time went on. And that definitely leans into the fact that this film itself definitely changed a lot about cinema. Like I said, it was a huge inspiration for Steven Spielberg, who just a couple decades later would end up making Jaws, which has continually been referenced as one of the best films ever made, especially anything having to do with the water. And there was so much that they pulled from this movie to make that movie work decades later. The basic premise of this film is that we follow a group of researchers and scientists who have found some sort of fossil for some creature, a hand that looks like it's a mix of a human and a fish. They end up going back to where that was found and finding out that there's something in the water that seems to be a mix of a man and a fish. So over the course of the film, they get in and out of the water, trying to capture this thing, trying to capture a picture of it, trying to lure it out, trying to attack it, and trying to save those who continually get killed by the creature. Now, I definitely have more I want to say on the movie, but let's go ahead and throw it over to my buddy Ryan from Worst Reviews, and then we'll get into the rest of my thoughts on this movie. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Worst, and I'm back you know, doing another dual review with my buddy Anthony A. Perez. Um, this time, it's going to be on Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, I actually have never seen this movie before this, believe it or not, even though I have heard of it, there's, um, it's, it's one of the universal monster movies. So that means basically any of those movies are going to be like all throughout modern pop culture. It's kind of a novelty kind of movie was kind of the vibe for me. Like, it, I mean, obviously for the time it's an early fifties. B movie so it's not gonna be like the best and I'm sure at the time it was just kind of a fun entertaining popcorn movie I know that like Guillermo del Toro did Shape of Water and it's kind of based on Creature from the Black Lagoon I haven't actually seen that movie and also Guillermo del Toro did uh, had inspiration from Creature from the Black Lagoon for Ape Sapien, that character, and Hellboy. I enjoyed sitting through it, but at the end of the day, it is a early 50s B movie. I'm sure it's one of the foundational movies for like modern horror movies, maybe like slasher movies where it, you know, or Jaws. Jaws is 1000% Jaws is basic. This is the old Jaws, <laughs> kind of. It's just, it's Jaws, but not. <laughs> like, it's not a shark. It's, it's a fish man. <laughs> so, like, at the end of the day, for me, and not negatively, but at the end of the day, I would imagine you're watching it just for the suit. Millicent Patrick, who is uncredited, um, design the suit. I could imagine you could find the best use of this movie at like a Halloween party, throwing it on in the background or like throwing it on with friends to make fun of. I was actually surprised to know that there's not a Mystery Science Theater episode. That's actually the first way I thought to look up doing this because I would have loved to watch an episode of them doing it, but maybe it's good enough or classic enough that they were like no but they did i think they did the sequel um return of the creature so that one is probably not good at all <laughs> that, that is not a remembered movie but anyway guys that's just my quick thoughts it's just the only uh, the only reason to really watch this movie is kind of for the trivia of it and the novelty that it predates so many other movies that kind of follow this formula and like maybe you'll like maybe somebody out there will super enjoy it i didn't super enjoy this movie but it's not bad definitely not a bad movie it's just i would say what i would say is beyond you know universal monster movies and the like dracula frankenstein Phantom of the Opera, I believe, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, The Mummy, Invisible Man. To me, I would put all of those before watching this movie. <laughs> like, um, like I said, I haven't seen all of them. I would love to at some point. Um, just never have got around to it. I don't know. Um, but 
Oh well, um, this actually this inspires me. Maybe I'll go and binge them all tonight. I don't know. So anyway, guys, let me just throw it back to Anthony and. I'll see y'all next time. A big thanks to Ryan of Worst Reviews for joining me here in another video. Always a pleasure to have you on, my friend. I've loved doing any collab reviews we've done in the past. And again, a big thanks for joining me recently for my return of Random Rambling, which I do plan on continuing further. Yeah, man, I, I could definitely see where you're coming from when it comes to this movie. This is definitely a good movie to throw on in the background when it comes to a Halloween party and can definitely be a movie to kind of put on to kind of poke some fun at by today's standards. But yeah, you know, I'm glad you enjoyed it at least on a novelty level of going back and kind of being able to watch this movie that's a classic film and kind of just add that to your knowledge about classic films in general. Yeah, going into this movie, as I mentioned, there's a lot about it that works and there's a lot about it that doesn't work. And I think one of the biggest things that both Ryan and I definitely agree on that definitely works is the Gill Man himself, the Gill Man suit, the creature from the Black Lagoon, again, played by Rico Browning here. I thought that without a doubt, the suit is what still really holds up in this movie with there being elements of the suit that actually move on their own, like the gills on the side of the face. And overall, outside of the eyes that can seem very lifeless throughout the course of the film, the suit itself still really looks good, especially with the underwater scenes. The director of this film, Jack Arnold, actually saw a video of Rico Browning doing some diving and some swimming, and that's what actually got him the role as the creature. And there's actually a lot of this movie that he has to be underwater actually swimming, pretty deep dives in this suit. And I can only imagine for a special effects suit made in the 50s, it must have been rather difficult to move in and breathe in. So I gotta give a lot of respect to Rico Browning and how well he swims in this suit throughout the course of the film. Because this isn't a movie that has a couple of underwater scenes or is just something that was filmed only in a pool. They really did film this actually here in a part of Florida in a swamp in the water. And sure, there are some studio lit shots that definitely are uh, not in a real lake or lit real pond. Uh, but when it comes to a lot of this movie, there is a lot of it that has that gucky, nasty, grimy look to it that is in some sort of swampy water where our actors really had to swim in this water, specifically Rico Browning, who had to be in this completely covered suit, trusting that he'd be able to breathe and do what he has to do down there. And it was really interesting to kind of look into kind of the behind the scenes of this movie as I learned that Rico Browning would actually use a tube breathing method to uh, actually take these takes underwater where they would feed a tube underwater and he learned how to breathe in and out of this tube so he could stay underwater and continue the takes. And he was the one who ended up directing the underwater scenes with there actually being some really well shot action sequences and a lot of the most memorable moments of this movie are all underwater with a lot of the stunt work that Rico Browning himself had to do and some really, really impressive swimming in what was probably a very heavy suit. Now, as I mentioned before, there's some redundancy in this movie, and I think without a doubt, it's the part that once they get there to the location that the creature from the Black Lagoon is at, the majority of the movie after that is the characters getting in and out of the water continuously until the end of the runtime, where they end up killing the creature, or so you think. Think. And in traditional classic film format, as soon as he's killed, the movie just ends. It says the end, and that's the end. You know, we don't even get to see our characters leave. We don't really get to see where they go. We don't get to see if they go back to the world and tell the world about their research. The, the movie just ends. And that's something that I've always kind of appreciated about older cinema is that they don't really hold back in that level. It just kind of just jumps straight to the end with the end credits. And so, yeah, watching this movie back, there was definitely some goofy elements. There's definitely things about it that don't work 110%. There are moments of dialogue and line delivery that are hilarious by today's standards uh, but going back and watching it I was actually really engaged and interested to see where it was going to go again I've seen this movie before but it had been decades so there were small moments that I didn't really remember there were small moments of dialogue and just some really cool moments itself when it came to the Gill Man that I found myself really invested in I was just never bored while watching the movie even if I can also admit that there were slow moments that I could see probably would bore some since I'm kind of going into this as a kind of a fan of the past and fast past films and i've seen a lot of movies like this already in terms of this era it's not something i'm completely unfamiliar with but i could see if this is something that you've never seen before and you're kind of diving back into some older cinema and you don't really know what to expect fully in terms of tone and pacing this movie can probably bore some and definitely make some feel like it's very redundant which in a lot of cases it is so overall where this movie really shines for me is the gill man himself a lot of the underwater sequences and a lot of the tension that's built between 
seeing these individuals trying to get him. I do really buy into the performances. Of course, you have to buy into it and the fact that it's a bit of a cheesier reality than, you know, what a modern movie is going to kind of show to us as an audience where you can really believe a modern movie in terms of the performances and believe that those characters exist. In the case of this, you know, it feels more like a stage play brought to screen as most films from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and even the 60s a lot of times really did feel. But yeah, overall, I had a lot of fun watching it. All the underwater stuff I thought, thought was really cool. There's some really great sequences that they were able to capture all those decades ago that still really stand the test of time. Rico Browning did phenomenally as the Gill Man here and did a lot of really great swimming and would continue after this film to still play the character in certain installments as well as uh, just be somebody who would do tons of underwater coordinating for other films and be, uh, you know, a, a side director or a secondary director for a lot of underwater things in general in future films as well as being a uh, stunt coordinator and different things like that for various shows and he even did an underwater mermaid show at a certain point for audiences where he would use the tube breathing method so big uh, kudos to Rico Browning and a really phenomenal career when it comes to just being somebody who swims incredibly. So yeah, guys, a big thanks to you guys for watching and a big thanks to Ryan for joining me here in this video. As usual, you can find the link to any of my guests down below in the description box. Go give them some love. Let them know I sent you. And what do you guys think about Creature from the Black Lagoon? Is this a movie you enjoy? Is it a movie you don't enjoy? Do you think it's worth kind of having that classic status? Or do you think it's a movie that's overrated? Definitely want to hear what you guys have to say down below. So definitely chime in and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.